1994, Terry and Gwen Sherman purchased a 480-acre ranch in northeastern Utah. Terry Sherman was a very, very experienced cattle rancher. Apparently, he had multiple degrees, including animal husbandry. And in fact, he was such a good cattle rancher that he carried a very low percentage of cattle loss compared to other ranchers. So with this impeccable resume, it was very shocking for Terry and Gwen Sherman to sell their ranch only two years after buying it. You see, this area of Utah is notorious for UFO sightings, Bigfoot sightings, and as we talked about in part one, skinwalkers. Now, of course, a lot of people in modern times thought that Terry and Gwen Sherman were pulling some big hoax. However, the Ute tribe, whose reservation was right beside the Sherman's ranch, knew that they were not pulling a prank. You see, the Ute tribe, well, they forbid their people from setting foot on the Sherman property because the property is the pathway of the skinwalker. And as we said in part one, which is down below if you have not seen part one, the skinwalker is primarily a Navajo folklore and this land is not Navajo. This is Ute land. But before we get started, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and give us a like. If you want to help support the channel, there is a Patreon link down below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're going to talk about Skinwalker Ranch. Part one, as I said, we talked a lot about the Navajo people, their folklore, and their legends of the skinwalker. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about how a skinwalker comes to be in this video. So again, if you have not seen that, I do suggest clicking below and watching that video first. Today's focus is the history of the skinwalker in this particular area, which again is not Navajo land. Again, this is Ute land. So the Ute tribe was another fairly large tribe in the western side of the United States. They took up Colorado, part of Utah, and part of New Mexico. So they were neighbors to the Navajos. And if you haven't figured it out by now, the state name of Utah comes from the Ute tribe. Now I have to admit something, I am not as I've said before, I don't have any Native American in my family and me, so a lot of the customs and the cultures I've learned secondhand or through research. And because I'm from the eastern side of the United States, I am more familiar with tribes like the Cherokee. The Navajo, the Ute, the Hopi, all the tribes that lived out west, I'm not so familiar with. However, I find the Ute tribe to be very fascinating. Before the white man, the European, came to the Americas in exploration, of course we had all these different tribes living on this land. And as any neighboring tribe would do, they traded and had wars and had all sorts of relationships with each other. And from what I found, the Ute tribe and the Navajo tribe have a very long history a history filled with a love-hate relationship. In earlier days, the Ute tribe would often trade with the Navajo. It seemed that the Navajo were really good at making wool blankets. And where the Utes lived was in some areas a lot colder than where the Navajo lived. Of course, Colorado, Utah, these states do experience snow. And so the Utes and the Navajo maintained a business-like relationship for a very long time where they would trade necessities with each other. However, it was in 1581 that the Utes started trading with the Spanish explorers coming up through what is now Mexico. And what the Spanish explorers brought to the Utes was horses. These horses that the Spaniards brought became one of the Utes' most valuable commodities. And over time, the Utes became very skilled at 
battling with horses. These horses allowed the Utes to be less defensive of their land and they were able to invade other tribes easier. In fact, the Ute became known for their raids and the women in the tribe would often follow behind the men and after the men would raid a certain tribe, the women would do this loot dance that is so fantastic to look at now, this celebration of raiding another person's land. In fact, the Navajo would even within their own communities, your prestige was judged by how many horses you had and what your horsemanship was like. The Ute tribe, literally the horse became like their gold standard all of a sudden. The horse just changed everything for the Utes. Now, not only did the Utes have their loot dances for after raid, but they also had what they called war parties before a raid was set to take place. These war party consisted of obviously the warriors and their own medicine men and the chiefs of the tribe. And during these war parties, they would fast, they would do sweat lodge ceremonies, and they would participate in painting each other's bodies and the bodies of their horses. Because of this, obviously tribes like the Navajo and other neighboring tribes started to have some issues with the Ute. Now it is said that the Ute started kidnapping women and children from the Navajo and allegedly selling them to the slave markets in New Mexico that were run by the Europeans. Two households, both alike in dignity and fair Verona, where we lay our scene. Obviously, that's the first few lines of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, but it very much reminds me of the drama between these neighboring tribes. I mean, drama is probably a very light word because this was consisted of human trafficking and invading for reasons of material wealth. But I guess regardless of where you're from in the world, what your ancestries is, all humans are the same, right? But the issues between the Navajo and the Utes did not end here with the human trafficking. Because she, you see, as time went on and as the Europeans became more of a presence in this land, more things started to happen. It was in 1847 that the Utes themselves started to have more problems with the Europeans. This time it wasn't the Spanish that were coming into trade, but it was the Mormons that were coming into the Utah area to set up a homestead for themselves. Now I'm not gonna go into detail about all the issues between the Native Americans and the Mormons. That would be for a completely different show. Although there are a lot of podcasts and a lot of YouTubes you can find about all those issues if that's something you're interested in. I wanna focus more on what happened with the European settlers, the Utes and the Navajos to create the legend of the Skinwalker in the Ute area. In part one, we did talk about the long walk of the Navajo that happened in 1864 after the Navajo lost its battle to the United States of America, requiring the Navajo to move off their land. And you see the Ute tribe join the campaign with the United States against the Navajo people. The Ute tribe are part of the reason why the Navajo ended up having to take their long walk in 1864. Now, if you remember from our part one, we talked about how during this long walk, conditions were terrible. And so some of the Navajo intentionally became skinwalkers just to ex escape the reality of their conditions. It is also during this time that it is believed by many of the Ute people, even to this day, that the Navajo released skinwalkers on Ute property as an act of revenge against the Ute and so for 15 generations now, the Ute people believe that the Skinwalker has lingered up in this area where the Shermans bought their ranch. Now, something I learned researching this yesterday was that these are not Skinwalkers that have reproduced. It's not a generation and generation and a generation of Skinwalkers. It's the same Skinwalkers that were released 
1864. And as we know, time is relative. So even though 15 generations have now passed and we're living in a very different time, I can understand that the fury of these skinwalkers is probably very raw still. Now, on top of this being a skinwalker land, in my opinion, there seems to be some sort of portal here, too. We talked about this with Glam's Castle, that there are certain places on the earth that just are electric. And we'll see this in the story as we get more into the Shermans with their experiences with things like UFOs. And just so you know, these UFO sightings date back as far as the 1700s by these said Spanish explorers. So it wasn't the skinwalkers that brought about the portal. The portal seemed to already be there. And with the skinwalkers there too, you're just looking at the perfect storm. Now, in 1905, a family named the Myers bought this property, and the Myers stayed on the property until 1987. Now, the Myers never reported any strange occurrences on their land. However, it is my opinion that they probably did experience strange things. You see, the Myers left the property in 1987, and the property sat empty for about seven years before Terry and Gwen Sherman bought it in 1994. Now, when Sherry and Gwen came to the property, they noticed that everything was locked up in chains. And we're not talking about just the front door or just the gate. They went inside the house and there were doors inside the house that were locked and chained as well. They also noticed that there were padlocks on all the windows, including the cabinets too. Very, very odd. And then outside, they saw these huge chains on poles that looked like they were, they were there to restrain a very large animal. Now, I don't know about you guys, but in my opinion, ranchers and farmers, they probably don't scare easily. So when I hear these accounts from the Shermans, I tend to believe them because Again, Terry Sherman was a very respectable rancher. He wasn't new at this job. And if he thought it was odd that all these chains were everywhere, then I'm sure it probably was odd. And, and after hearing the stories the Shermans later had to share about this property, it is my opinion that the Myers did experience phenomenon on their land. They just didn't tell anyone. And I don't know if it's because, you know, this is Mormon land and I don't know if they're just really religious Mormons. And so sometimes when weird stuff happens, if you hold on to a religion or a dogma too tightly, it causes a lot of cognitive dissonance. I don't know. Or maybe because for most of the time they lived on this property was a more respectable time and a time where you didn't air your dirty laundry. So that could have been part of it too. But for whatever reasons, the Myers never said anything to anyone regarding what was happening to them. Now, besides seeing all the chains everywhere on the house on the property, weird things started happening immediately to the Shermans when they moved in. Now, the Shermans had two children that they moved to the property as well, of course, and they moved all their livestock. Well, as they were setting up their livestock and getting themselves settled into their land, this wolf walked out of the forest. Now, the Shermans claimed that when the wolf started walking towards them, they all got very calm. And you'll hear this a lot. It's almost like whatever is on the property has this ability to emotionally manipulate whatever living thing is around, not just humans, but animals too. And so this wolf starts coming close to them and they're just standing there watching it. Now this wolf isn't like any other normal wolf we see around. This wolf was three times its average size. Also something really important to note. This again was 1994 and apparently, allegedly, the last wolf was shot in Utah in 1929. But this wolf walks up and he's looking at the family and it's all hunky-dory until he decides to bite the nose of a calf. Now I'm gonna warn you, one of the hardest, at least for me anyway, one of the hardest parts of this overall story 
are the numerous accounts of animal abuse and animal mutilation. And so if that's something that you are have really struggle with, I just warn you to be cautious moving forward because unfortunately I'm gonna have to talk about some of that. It's hard for me to talk about it. I am a huge animal lover and I'm a vegetarian. I just really don't wanna to have to bring this stuff up, but it is a very, very important part of the overall story. So the wolf grabs the calf by its nose and it's trying to pull the calf through the fence. Now, of course, the calf is screaming out in pain. And so Terry Sherman tries first to beat the wolf off the calf. Now, the, the wolf won't let go, so he tells his son to get his gun. The son goes to get his gun and he proceeds to shoot the wolf. Now, after the first shot, the wolf doesn't make any any type of indication that it's in pain or even felt the shot. And so Terry keeps shooting and eventually he, sh he shoots a part of the wolf off, which lands right there on the ground. And at that point, the wolf lets go of the calf and starts to walk away, basically unfazed. And so Terry Sherman is standing there with his family, this guy who is a super, expert at animals and it's like he's never seen anything like this before this is so freaking weird and so he takes his son and they start to track the wolf they can see blood they follow its steps and they get about a mile into the forest and all of a sudden the tracks just vanish it's like the wolf just vanished and this is going to happen many many times on this farm they're going to follow tracks that just disappear so after they've realized that this strange wolf-like creature is now nowhere to be seen, they head back to where the calf is. Now, of course, the calf is, calf is a little bit in pain, but it's, it's okay. And they look down at this piece of flesh from the wolf that they shot off. This flesh is still there. And apparently, all of a sudden, the flesh makes this horrible odor, almost like it's been rotting for ages almost like the odor people talk about when they're experiencing demonic activity. Now, if I'm gonna be completely honest, that one event would have pushed me off the property, but not for the Shermans. They hung on for two more years. And for these two years from 1994 to 1996, all hell would break loose. The next event happened about two weeks after the first event, and Gwen Sherman was driving home on the ranch up to the house where another wolf came out of nowhere. This wolf also had a companion with him. The companion looked to be like a dog with a really big head. Now, both of these beasts were taller than the actual car, and I can imagine she probably just had a regular like four door sedan, nothing super special. And to have a wolf that is that much taller that it has to bend down to heavily breathe on this car to scratch this car. And again, this is very similar to the stories we spoke about in the first video with the skinwalker. Well, they will try to attack people in their car, except for most of those stories, come from nighttime, this apparently happened in the middle of the day. In fact, on Skinwalker property where all this goes on, it doesn't even seem to matter what time of day it is for this strange phenomenon to happen. And so as time goes on, more and more strange creatures would appear on the property, especially treats creatures that should not be in this area of the world like tropical birds. In fact, the Shermans would see red birds that look like they belonged in Jamaica flying all over their property. Now, the Shermans also experienced crop circles, which are really, really common in the UFO community. And at one point they had seen an actual what appeared to be UFO up close and personal. For a long time, Terry Sherman thought that this was probably military doing this, but then over time he ended up changing his mind and realized this wasn't necessarily uh, the military. At this point, there was this spaceship that hovered above the property. It was about 20 feet above the ground. Now this UFO was the size of two football fields with lights coming off of it and they could see inside of the flying object. Inside there appeared to be a man sitting there at a desk taking notes. Now this man, this humanoid type creature, had a helmet on. 
and all of a sudden they saw him stand up inside the UFO and he appeared to be about seven feet tall. Now this was fascinating to me and I did try to find a picture, although every time these pictures get posted, they get scrubbed. There is a gentleman that has been seen around our president lately with his secret service that appears to be over seven feet tall. Again, anytime anybody posts it and starts asking who this person is, people tend to make the pictures disappear. Now, a lot of people believe that earthlings, us people on planet earth, have had communication with aliens for a very long time, especially people in control, especially the presidents of the United States. Many people also believe that our current president, our 45th president, will be the one to disclose this information to the public. And in fact, if you look back at our RH negative video, there are many people that believe the RH negatives, like myself, are hybrid of a human and some extraterrestrial being like the Anunnaki. Now, I'm not saying that the man with our president is an alien. It's just very suspicious how tall he is and how his identity gets scrubbed off of the internet anytime someone puts it up. And his physical characteristics do sound very familiar to this humanoid being in this spacecraft on the Sherman's property. Now other things would happen as well that didn't necessarily appear to be a part of the skinwalker phenomenon or the UFO phenomenon, maybe more poltergeist like. For example, Gwen Sherman would come home from the grocery store, she would bring all of her groceries in, she would unpack the groceries, get them all put away, she would go to the house to do something else and then she would come back into the kitchen and all the groceries would be right back in the bags as if no one had touched them. Odd things would happen when Gwen would cook as well. For example, if she was using a spatula while she was cooking, she would put the spatula down to do something and go to get it again and it would be gone later to be found in the freezer. The salt and pepper would get switched all the time. Another phenomenon that would happen to Gwen too would be when she was in the shower. You see, having two young children, Gwen would often lock the bathroom door while she was showering and she would bring a towel, of course, and her hairbrush into the shower for when she was done. And on many occasions with the door locked, she would get out of the shower to not have a towel or her hairbrush available. Now this issue of household items going missing randomly wasn't just in the house itself. This would also happen out on the property with Terry Sherman while he was working his land every day. For example, in one story, apparently Terry had been working with a post hole digger. Now a post hole digger is probably about 70 pounds. It's not something light like a spatula. This would take a bit of effort to pick up. And obviously he was out digging these holes and all of a sudden this post hole digger is missing. Well, Terry being the logical man that he is, even after experiencing so much phenomenon on his farm, goes back to the house and asks his son, his wife, where is this post hole digger? Is somebody playing a prank? Where did it go? And nobody knows what he's talking about. Well, they eventually find his post hole digger up in the top of a tree. Now, besides demonic animals wanting to terrorize you and your livestock, there was something else that would happen. And this was the incident that really pushed Gwen Sherman to want to leave the property. And this was the incident that they would have all the time with these different orbs. Now, most of the orbs would come in all these different colors, but the one that was the most troubling was the blue orb. Apparently, when the blue orb would come around, everyone, including the animals would start to feel panicked. The blue orb was so strong that it would dim the lights on the property. Now what would follow these blue orbs in my opinion is quite horrific. You see usually when blue orbs would appear that's when they would all of a sudden have crop circles 
drop down on their property as well as cattle mutilation. Now cattle mutilation isn't something that just happened on the Sherman's property. In fact, there are stories from a bunch of ranchers in this area that have experienced this cattle mutilation. Cattle mutilation is very different than a livestock, a cattle, an animal being taken by prey. When that happens, it's obvious there's usually a lot of blood, bite marks, that this was just an act of nature. But with cattle mutilation, it's very surgical. And a lot of times the animal, the cow, has been drained of all blood and might be missing organs like the eyes or the tongue or colon or any type of, of reproductive organs, like it had been removed surgically. Now, as I said in the beginning that D Terry Sherman was like a pro. I mean, he was a rancher through and through. Before moving to this property, he already had a really good reputation and he had the reputation of not losing a lot of his cattle. Of course, if you have livestock, you're always gonna risk and have a certain amount of percentage of your livestock die unexpectedly. That's just life. But again, Car Terry was very good at maintaining his livestock's life until they moved to this particular ranch. When they moved in, they had 80 heads of cattle. And by the time that they had left the ranch, 14 of their cattle had either gone missing, just disappeared, or had died from cattle mutilation. That's 18% of your livestock. Now for a rancher, again, I'm a huge animal lover, so I don't like putting a price tag on any living being, but for a cattle rancher, you've lost in about $30,000 worth of your business. Now you might be asking how can an 1,000 pound cow just vanish? Yes, we know that some of the cows or mutilated, but but how does a cow, the other cows, just vanish? Well, according to Terry Sherman, there was one day he was out on his horses trying to track one of his cows, and he's so good at what he does, he can look at uh, paw prints, cow prints, hoof prints, and he can tell you whether the animal was walking or running. By these hoof prints in the snow, he knew that this cow had been running through the snow. My great granddad was a dairy farmer. I don't think I've actually ever seen a cow run. Now, just like the wolf in the beginning that he tracked, when tracking this cow, he was following these hoof prints where all of a sudden they just abruptly stop. It's like the cow just vanished out of nowhere. Where did it go? It's not like a helicopter could come pick up an 1,000 pound heifer. This is when Terry Sherman started to accept that there was possibly a portal to another dimension on his property. And this is where a lot of these cows were disappearing too. There is also a story where there was a canal on his property and they could see something splashing and playing in the canal, but nothing was there. That alone would probably terrify me too. There's also a story of another resident of Utah that wanted to come onto the property to meditate. I don't know if by this point word had gotten out that there was something really weird about this property or what, but they allowed him to come onto the property to do his meditation. And as he was sitting out in nature, trying to become one with nature, Terry Sherman and his son saw something hurtling towards this man. This entity started roaring and screaming at this gentleman trying to find God on the Sherman property. And of course, this terrified the man. He jumped up and ran away. And I don't know if that man's ever been back on the property or not. I would love to talk to that guy, but if he's like me, he probably don't wanna talk about it because it was just too horrific. Now, as I told you, Gwen Sherman was ready to leave the property as soon as the blue orbs started showing up with all their nefarious effects. But it wasn't until one incident that pushed Terry to leave the property. And unfortunately to, for me, this is the most horrific incident that there was on the property. And I'm gonna have a really hard time retelling it. I'm just gonna give you the Cliff Notes version. Of course, being a farmer, a rancher, Terry had a lot of dogs. And in fact, the dog pen would often be 
opened without anybody opening it. That was another thing that would happen. However, one night, uh, Terry had three of his most beloved dogs out with him and they saw something and they ran off to chase this light. Well, Terry could hear the dogs screaming in pain in the distance. And when he went to go check on the dogs, it looked like they had been incinerated right there on the property. At that point, Terry packed his family up, up and they left Skidwalker Ranch. I mean, I just can't. I don't know if I could ever get over that. My dog is like my child. I would jump in front of a bullet for my dog. He is my baby. I cannot imagine the devastation they must have felt losing three of their dogs that way. I mean, dogs become part of your family. It's not just a pet. They are, they are a part of your family, and that is just, I'm, I feel so bad for the Shermans for having to experience that. Well, word about the craziness of the ranch obviously spread, and when Terry Sherman went to sell it, he quickly got an offer for from an American millionaire named Robert Bigelow. Bigelow paid about $200,000 for the property back in 1998, and Bigelow brought his company onto the ranch to start to research the phenomenon. Now, he did have Terry Sherman signed a non-disclosure agreement at that point that Terry would not talk about what had happened on the ranch. Now we know all the information we know today because two of the employees of Robert Bigelow wrote a book, which I'll link below the, to Amazon to that book called Hunt for the Skinwalker. Now, Robert Bigelow's company was called the National Institute of Discovery Science, or NIDS for short. And Robert Bigelow kept Terry on, even though Terry moved away from the property. They actually bought another ranch about 25 miles away from the property. He kept Terry on to help him help his team with the research. Terry knows everything about their about a ranch and so Terry stayed on as the ranch manager. So here this man now is running his own ranch as well as helping this company study his previously owned ranch. Terry did though obviously move his livestock off the property and move them to the new property and Robert Bigelow brought in more livestock to be almost like bait for whatever was happening on this land. Now, Terry did tell these people that they needed to go in quietly, not to go onto the property and start making a scene to try to attract whatever it was. Unfortunately, they did not listen to Terry and they went in rather loudly. They did catch some phenomenon, but not as much as the Shermans themselves had caught. And in 2004, Robert Bigelow changed the name of the company that was researching this property. He changed it to the Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Study, or BASS for short. And this company was set aside to study fringe areas of science. It's at this point that things got a little bit weird. Now we know Area 51 is in that area too, and um, the government's a little bit involved with that, and it was released by the New York Times, if you can believe the New York Times, but whatever. It was released by the New York Times that about $22 million was being spent from the government on this company to research the Sherman land. And this was being pushed by a Democrat from the state of Nevada named Harry Reid. And Harry Reid was the Senate House majority at the time and suspiciously was also friends with Bigelow as we're currently learning with our little situation with St. James Island and all the usual suspects that were down there. When things get weird involving government, you'd be surprised how many people are connected. But then to make it even stranger, in 2016, Bigelow sold the property to a shell organization for $4.5 million. So a shell organization is usually an organization that people use to hide the actual buyer. Now, according to sources that have done far more digging than I have, this shell organization is still heavily involved with studying the land. Only now, we're not so privy to what's going on on this piece of property. And this is the organization that officially changed the ranch's name to Skinwalker Ranch. It had been referred to as Sherman Ranch before, but now it is actually 
Skinwalker Ranch. Again, in 2016, another peculiar thing happened. There was a road, a public access road that went right through the property. This happens a lot, whether you know it or not. If you're driving around in the country, sometimes you're actually driving straight through somebody's property, but it's a public road, so no big deal. Well, this road was called the Hicken Ranch Road, and they basically cut it off and put a fence up and said, nope, this is private now, nobody can drive through absolutely no trespassing, get off the property, leave us alone, we gotta figure this stuff out. And that's basically where we're left today. That's all she wrote. Now, a lot of people think that maybe there's something that's being released on this property that's causing hallucinations. There's also other theories. Some people think it's all a hoax. I doubt it, because the Shermans really haven't sought out publicity. But I bet you there's one group of people that know exactly what's going on, and that's the Ute people. They've been telling us since the beginning for 15 generations now, don't step foot on that property. That's the Skinwalker walkway from our neighbors, the Navajo. All right, guys, I know that was a long one today, and I really appreciate you sitting through that. Please let me know if you have any experience with the Ute people or the Navajo people, or if you yourself have experienced a skinwalker, just leave me a comment down below, or if you've driven by the ranch. I know a lot of people try to go by the ranch and try to get in, but of course, it's no trespassing, their signs up, all that kind of stuff. Again, there's a lot of information out there about this area with the UFOs and all that kind of stuff. And I am gonna leave below a really good podcast I listened to that goes over all of this where they go far more in depth than I did if you want any more information. Again, thank you to Josh McKay for doing our music and to Todd Roderick for helping me edit. Also, thank you to David Zublik. I've been going on his channel once a week now to go into more detail over these fascinating topics. It's really great, so you should go check it out. It's awesome to be able to have banter with someone because I run this like a storytelling channel. It's just me trying to cover the basis of a story to tell you, but with David, I actually get to really dig deeper because it's two people talking about a topic and two minds are always greater than one. So if you want to go over to his channel, there will be a link down below where you can go check out some of the stuff we've done together. All right, guys, I will talk to you soon. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye.